Ruth asked me to talk about um, how we, in an academic environment and through the Lloyd's Register Foundation funding, are influencing or making a difference, as this session is about, to uh, standards and international standards, particularly for us in the oil and gas industry and the design of offshore foundations. So today I'll, I'll talk about some of the challenges and the risks that we have when we build in the, in the ocean environment. Uh, maybe I'll be the, the yin and the yang to the previous um, talk about, so the previous talk was on how do we get university research in industry, so this will be a bit more like how do we get industry research in an academic, in a university environment. So I'll give a little bit of our strategy for doing that and our strategy for developing standards. Uh, and then though we, um, on many applications, I'll just pick one application to try to go through how we are influencing standards, and that is of the mobile jack-up platform. So uh, we've heard already in this conference um, yesterday from Vincent about food and Nancy this morning about how uh, we, the world, some of the grand challenges with population growth and taking people out of poverty. Uh, and the same is in the energy sector. The, the demand for energy has doubled over the last 30 years, and this insatiable appetite for energy is going to continue as we bring billions of people out of poverty. The oceans uh, hold some solutions to that, uh, and here are some frontier regions uh, of ocean uh, technology. Um, a lot of hydrocarbons have been found in, in the shallow waters, they've gone off the continental shelf already uh, into deeper water. Uh, there's the, um, in Australia, we're, we're about to build a 500 metre by 80 metre floating natural, uh, liquefied natural gas, so it's a big very big refrigerator, weighs about six times as much as the uh, aircraft frigate, 600,000 tonnes. Um, the other, you'd be aware, is a lot of marine renewable research going on. How do we be, build wave, tidal, wind turbines in the more shallower waters? Uh, but all of this infrastructure needs to be stabilised onto the seabed. So if we're going to unlock this energy to bring people out of poverty, we need to stabilise it to ensure that these very large investments for instance, in my state of Western Australia, we've just built $200 billion, or about 100 billion pounds worth of offshore infrastructure. We need to stabilise that under cyclonic uh, and also operating conditions. So here we have some examples. We've got anchoring systems for these floating vessels, uh, pipelines. I mean, they're like one, hundreds of kilometres of one big foundation as they're laid on the seabed. That middle is the jack-up platform, which I'll give all the examples of, but also there's some examples of some renewable energy infrastructure. So what's the challenge? Well, they're very large. This is a very large foundation, very large loads. These are uh, suction pile anchors uh, being used for deep water anchoring. Uh, here's um, just an example of a, a floating development over Houston, if you sort of you can see the sort of scale of the, of the enterprise. Um, enormous costs, very difficult to build offshore, large costs of site investigation and construction itself. And the challenge really for us is unlike um, uh, the previous presentation and even our new about space where we've got material or even graphene where we can actually build our materials in the offshore in the soil mechanics you, you don't you, you get what you're given so the soil's there it's different wherever you go you need to be able to understand it for particular sites uh, and that's a real challenge for for what we're doing um, why is this important for risk of life and critical infrastructure I mean, one of the examples which people will be aware of is Katrina and Rita. Not only was there damage in Louisiana, uh, and, but there was a lot of offshore damage and 21 uh, different anchoring mooring line failures. We had platforms turtling, um, uh, large billion dollars of losses of infrastructure. And on the right-hand side here, that's the jack-up platform, which I'll talk about soon. There was 10 of these lost in those, that hurricane season. A bit closer to home from where I come from, just a couple of years ago, the um, Atwood Osprey broke its mooring lines and anchors and started drifting around 5.5 uh, kilometres of drifting uh, in the storm, which caused another, so this was a Chevron um, project, that caused Woodside to have to shut down their production platform because when you've got a floating platform dragging anchors over the seabed near uh, operating pipelines, that's obviously a huge risk to people and, and, and infrastructure. So that's the context of why we're doing this. Um, again, as I said, so this is more industry work research in a university environment. So a little bit of our philosophy, really, is to be able to do good physical modelling of, of these um, offshore foundation problems. Uh, and this is our spinning there is a centrifuge. And we showed you some, uh, 
experiments of zero gravity experiments where we, that's all very easy. We're into high gravity experiments. So this machine can spin 200 kilograms of soil up to 200 G. And the reason we're doing that is because you just can't take a very big offshore foundation, bring it into the lab, into a bucket of soil. All the stresses will be wrong. So what we do is we accelerate gravity, increase the unit weight, and we can get the stress relationship between the large offshore foundation and the smaller physical model uh, correct. So we spin soil at to uh, 200 G and then we can get 1 to 200 scaling. We also look at numerical modelling techniques and observations from that. We like to develop the numerical models. It's another standard development for the industry. Put it into a theoretical context, but the idea is that then we can come up with models or analytical formulas that engineers can use in their daily design and eventually we can put into new guidelines such as the ISO the API or a Lloyd's Register or DNV guideline or uh, joint industry project type guidelines. I've taken standards being a bit more literal, or a li bit larger than that, sorry. I mean, also including like, improving standards of software, if we can improve industry standards of what they're using, uh, if we can change designs of foundations, we can improve physical infrastructure or even procedures. That's about me, how we're improving standards being used uh, in the industry. So now for some examples. Um, I'm going to talk about mobile jack-up platforms. Uh, and so this is a, 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 a mobile jack-up. It's used for the majority of drilling in water depths up to about 150 or so metres around the world. As you can see, it's a, a triangular uh, hull which can actually jack up. That's why it's called a jack-up. and Move up and down through three truss-worked legs which can be up to about 170 or so metres. Now, standing on this very big bar stool is a conical footing called a spud can, which is about 20 metres in diameter, so maybe about half the size of this room. So what we're trying to do is stabilise a platform uh, on these large foundations. How they operate is, and why they're useful is that they can self-install. So they get towed out to the site with their legs elevated above the water. Once on site, they drop those legs down and push these foundations by pushing the hull, pulling the hull up off the water and pushing these foundations into the seabed. Once they're installed, they lift the hull up and they can operate. But each of those components, those three components, has some risks involved. And these are sort of published failures between the 2007 and 2012, which have been published by uh, at the Jack Up conference. And so this is the uh, Noble Denton, which I think has been brought out by GLDNV. Uh, that's their database. They've got a database of 1,300 incidents over the last 60 years. I think about 130 incidents in this time period. And they've taken from those 130 the ones which cause total loss of a jack-up or severe damage, which I think they're characterising as greater than $5 million in damage, and then fatalities as well. And so you can see the context of that this is quite still uh, an industry which is uh, it's, it's having a high risk to people and to infrastructure and there's a need to to do things better. I suppose the, the two outstanding, I mean, any fatality uh, is horrendous, but there's two there. The 53 fatalities was actually um, uh, ice loading or iceberg off Sakhalin Island in, in Russia, hitting a, um, in towing, which flooded the platform and caused uh, it to sink. And the other one, uh, the foundation failure there is in the Gulf of Mexico, where it wasn't under a hurricane load, but under small, smaller loading, the cyclic loading on the foundation caused the instability. The whole platform was moving too much and actually hit a fixed platform, which caused a fire in the oil there, which uh, caused great damage and a, a bunch of fatalities, or an awful number of fatalities. Uh, I've highlighted in blue. Are these are the ones where really the work I'm talking about is going to influence. So installation, it's very difficult when you install this as I'll, I'll go through what this is called, punch through, leg damage, and also on location. How do we know how, how much load, how much storm loading can these platforms take? Uh, just again, the same paper. They, it's not all doom and gloom because they have been improving the safety. On the y-axis there is the cost impact of these incidents. And you can see that they, they have been reducing over, over the decades. Uh, and there's a little blip here uh, because of the Katrina and Rita. Uh, and 10 jack-ups to loss there, and I'll discuss that and what we're doing uh, to improve design methods in that area. So just to go through what some of these failures are. So here we are, we've got our jack-up, we're trying to install it, so we're trying to push these footings into the, to the seabed. If you've got very complex stratification of soil, and particularly if you've got a strong over a soft soil, you've got the potential of holding up one of those big foundations and legs 
in that strong soil, and then it suddenly gives way and pushes itself into the soft soil. You get a reduction of load, and you can get a rapid penetration of that load. It's like pulling the leg out of a bar stool, and you can get these type of what they call a punch-through failure, which I'll describe later. Uh, you also need to sometimes install next to footprints, so they might have come already with a jack up and put that in, in the ground. And that's, uh, you can see the three footprints there. They can be sort of 30 or so metres wide, 10, 15 metres in depth. And you might need to come back at a later time and try to get yourself installed in these different difficult footprint conditions. The worst thing that can happen is you could slide into the footprint and bang an existing platform. And another one I'll talk about is the storm loading. So how much load can one of these jack-ups take uh, in a hurricane? And the, the difficulty here is that you... You put the wave and winds on the legs, it causes a combined sort of vertical or pushing sideways horizontal and a rotational moment on those foundations. It's a difficult condition to analyse and what we're doing is trying to put models into, that can describe that into the overall um, package of the structural wave structure soil interaction and to avoid these type of conditions and their photos from after Katrina and Rita. So the international guidelines, which was what I was asked to talk about, they have published an ISO document on uh, how to analyse. So each time you go to a new site, you need to analyse whether it's safe to operate a jack up at that site, safe to install, safe to operate, safe to, to retrieve from that site. And that was published in 2011 following a previous tsunami guidelines. And so I'll sort of indicate where this is being updated through the sort of work that LRF and that we've been doing. So here's um, the punch through. So you've got your sand over clay, sand strong, clay's weak. Um, what we're doing here is a little video. This is in the centrifuge, so we're spinning at 200G here, and we've got half a spud can up against a window, and we're pushing it in, taking lots and lots of photos with the camera, to which we can then analyse. And from the right-hand side, these are the failure mechanisms. The first one's at the peak of the load, and the second one is below, where it's about now, where you can see it's pushed to this big sand. It's, got, it's now not just a spud can. It's a spud can with a lot of sand below it within the clay. And you can see from this experiment, this would have plunged eight metres. It's a, well, it's a 60 millimetre footing, which is a 12 metre meet, meet, diameter uh, in the prototype conditions. We can take those results, and, and as engineers, we see that as the failure mechanisms. We've added... Uh, um, other tests where we actually test the whole spud can and we take very accurate measurements of the load displacement and we can, because we're in a modelling environment, we can look at lots of sand thickness, diameters, all the different parameters, different sand conditions and get the testing conditions and, and, and analysis that we can then use to develop our formula and just to show a one complicated formula, that's the, the formula we come up with which now can be used by engineers so they don't have to repeat this process. So that formula is now, now published. If you look at it against the database that um, collected, you can see those little blue triangles there. It's a better improvement. So if you look at the centrifuge versus the calculated, it's got a better prediction than the ISO. And the reason is that the ISO was based on, on theoretical work about 50 years ago on very small footings of a different shape, uh, and they don't even account for the actual sand properties. So this is now under consideration for inclusion in the next draft of the ISO. Um, just the current projects, we've got two PhD students, one's just finishing from the LRF, and this is now less about writing standards but changing the way in which um, things might occur offshore. So what Stephanus has been doing is working with uh, um, Keppel Fells, the Jackup Builders, and Vanden AP Vandenberg, they build um, CPTs, which are cone penetrometer tests, so when we want to characterise soil, we push a big cone in. And what the standard at the moment is, you might go out... Uh, a few months before, you'll do one of these tests, you'll analyse the data, work out what soil's there, do your load penetration curve, give that to the operator. What we're working on is that putting this uh, into the actual jack-up itself. And so you might have done all of that beforehand. You come up on site, you bring your legs down, and then you push these cone polytrometers, I hope you can see that, through the spud can, and this is a final verification. So the, those companies are working on that, the hardware. We're working on the little block box that will sit on the, uh, the, the programming, the theory behind it, so that when we get that CPT result, we can, without any human intervention, convert that to a load penetration curve. And really just to be a red flag. So if there's a difference between what they might have thought before and what's actually at that site, it sort of red flags the operator and they can go and do something about it or make sure they don't go avoid sort of punch through conditions. We've just started another PhD funded through the LRF, which I think is really exciting, which is a, I mean, the standard really is to just come up with one curve here 
of a load, pen that's a load penetration curve. And you can see it goes up and then down again. That's the sort of condition you're trying to worry about in punch through. Um, but all soil's different, all loading's different. I'm trying to put this in a probabilistic context to give people more information about what the risks here is what this project is about. So we can, so we might be worried about this peak, the depth, where it would be below, what that punch through distance might be. So the idea here is we can put sort of variability around it and come up with sort of contour plots of what that would be and, and, and so then install that on the rig itself so people can have more information that they use. And, and, and even better still is as they're trying to penetrate this spud can, they're measuring what the loads are, why don't they use that to see whether it's actually what the engineers thought it would be in the first place. So this project, so here we are, we might have some prior assessment of what the peak would be. This QP load, that's the preload, that's the load you might want to go to. So you want to stay below that, and so most of those contours are below that, it's probably fine. You get some monitored data, you, your predictions go further away, you're using a Bayesian statistical uh, viewpoint here. That's good, you, it would be not, you'd be green flagging that you're in a better condition. If it's doing that and it's getting closer and closer to a failure, you're red flagging and then you can do something about it. Um, quickly on seabed footprints, um, the guidance in ISO that we, we helped with um, uses centrifuge tests that UWA has conducted, and it's, it's very minimal for this condition. So they're the centrifuge tests. Um, we actually use an actuator. I don't use my arm there to push it in. It's just showing what we did. But we just basically took footprints, made a footprint, and went to distances. And the only guidance that they have in industry is that if you want to avoid any uh, influence by the footprints, keep one diameter away from the edge of the footprint. If you want to come inside that, then no guidance at all. So the current project we have is to develop software, actually. that um, It's a very complicated problem, and the student is developing large deformation software, which we've been developing for over a decade in our group, but it's all sort of in-house software that you know, we need to be able to program it ourselves. And the idea here is to be able to develop it um, without any of those in-house programming techniques that anyone in the industry can use using sort of the typical software that's used in industry. And so we're publishing, which is basically what's called a Python script to be able to link between industry software uh, to do this more complex uh, large deformation analysis. Um, and how big a storm? Um, we've made various influences to the international guidelines there about penetration in sands and stiffness of spud cans under storm loading, um, the capacity of skirted foundations. Um, and what I'm going to talk a little bit about is that if when do, when do spud cans bury? Um, so the problem here being the existing tsunami document said that if you're pushing a spud can into just a clay, that it would start to bury itself because this cavity would collapse in on itself. And through our physical observations, through this technique of being able to put half a spud can above, uh, up against a window, we can actually see that the soil flows around from below, which you're seeing in that movie you can see the soil is coming from below, which meant that we could come up with use theory, come up with a formula. It's now in the ISO guidelines. But once you've done that, you've got a nicely buried spud can, there was no guidance on what capacity you have when possibly your Hurricane Katrina or Rita comes through. So what we've been looking at is doing more numerical work. So it's the triangle of numerical work, physical observations. We do full spud can tests and try to measure these capacity surfaces. Um, and, and the end, so it's quite a complex chart, but it's trying to show that the old tsunami guidelines were at this size in horizontal capacity. Um, the ISO committee got pretty excited and installed something which was these right-hand charts, um, which was based on a quite minimal amount of um, FE, finite element work, and our res results um, are sort of in between. So we're now trying to back calculate out these um, uh, extreme case, or the probably unconservative cases which are now in the guidelines. In conclusion, um, I'd like to say offshore foundations remain a challenge. It's different uh, wherever you go. Um, I tried to show through example how um, the LRF funding and how academic research can actually influence standard guidelines, uh, but also standards of software, how we're changing design of foundations and operational procedures. And like any academic, uh, as they push out these frontiers, there's going to be increasing challenges uh, to risk of people and infrastructure. Again, I'd like to uh, I just appreciate the funding that the Lloyd's Research Foundation provide us, as well as the Australian Research Council. 
Um, because I'm probably not the furthest away, I think Hawaii might be further. <laughs> but uh, I do like to say, if you, you as the Lloyd Register Foundation family, you're always welcome to visit us. If you are around Australia, the best way to see our centre, the Centre for Offshore Foundation Systems, is to hop on a Qantas plane. You can look at Ningaloo Reef on the way. That's our university and where we're located. Uh, in the meantime, please follow. Um, you can come to our website or contact me. And I just want to show one more video, which is that we've just installed a new centrifuge. Um, and this video was taken last week. And so this is our new, as you can see, we're just like playing with toys, really. So that's now a um, 10 meter diameter, a five meter radius centrifuge, which can spin 2.4 tons of soil up to 100 G. And that was spinning it our first time last week to 20 G. So we're you know, upgrading our t testing facilities so that we can do more work in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you.